Welcome back to 6.5 On The Road, the session, the series sponsored by Solidine. And joining me here for this session is my esteemed colleague, Dave Nicholson. Dave, it's great to be on here with you. It's uh, always nice to have a, a, another face to uh, be on the sessions. Absolutely now. good to be here with you, Alistair. And of course, we do have another face joining us today. We uh, do. Shimon, you're with Weka, uh, you are the CTO. So Shimon Ben David, Weka's made quite a lot of waves around providing high performance software defined storage and is on a mission to eliminate spinning disk from any use in, of useful data. I, th I, think, I think the word was eradicate. Eradicate. <laughs> Not just eliminate. So why eradicate spinning disk? We haven't been able to eradicate tape yet. Why eradicate spinning disk? So I think if we're looking at new workloads, uh, especially coming out with uh, AI and Gen AI workloads, there's massive amounts of data that are being utilized, uh, whether for training or inferencing, uh, all throughout multiple organizations. So data has been accumulated and computed on, right? So if we're looking at a lot of the implications of current spinning media versus newer flash media, like solid dimes, like QLCs that are being onboarded, uh, there's massive value for um, cheaper uh, at scale, especially with data reduction technologies like we're implementing, uh, and also power utilization, better power utilization at scale um, for these large AI projects, for frankly, for large newer compute environments. So when you talk about the Weka platform, what does that look like in terms of physical infrastructure? So you know, let's 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 think in terms of um, what we loosely refer to as a server, mm -hmm. something that is bounded by multiple sheet metal walls. Yeah. that's got you know some amount of uh, CPU networking and memory. Um, in this case, from a storage perspective, um, solid state like yeah. solid IM devices. Yeah. Uh, what does that look like for AI? compared to more traditional workloads? How, how, does it, how does it change from Weka's perspective? So, so if we're looking at the compute side, at the server side, usually mm -hmm. with uh, some sort of accelerator, a GPU, mm -hmm. IPU, or could, could be multiple different accelerators. Honestly, what that did, it shrunk the footprint of data ingestion from, in the past you had HPC centers that had thousands of servers, each of them uh, processing a trickle of data. Now we're, we're, that was shrunk, and now a single server is equivalent to 10 racks of, of previous environments, right? So, so suddenly that, uh, as you call a, sh a server, a sheet of metal with CPUs and, and GPUs and thousands of cores, is now able to ingest uh, terabytes of data, right, uh, per day, and, and get to a meaningful output. So the, the implication is we need to feed these servers with that massive amount of data at a high performance, uh, in order to make sure that uh, the GPUs or the accelerators are being utilized so I can get to an optimal time to my business value, to my outcome. Whether that's training a new model, whether that's inferencing on a model, on, on data that I already have, right? So that uh, ability to compute on more data faster now creates new challenges. Uh, first challenge, by the way, is on the networking. How do you, you take that massive compute power and how do you make sure that you're not feeding it with a straw? So if you look at previous storage environments or previous protocols, um, just on the networking, they, they, even, the, even if you had hundreds of gigabytes per second, the protocols themselves were like spoon feeding the, the GPUs. And as a result, you see the GPUs are loaded at 30% utilizations out of the 100% of capabilities. So then with Weka, that's what we, we set out to do, to make sure that we, we're creating a storage environment that can go through the network that is constantly increasing 100 gig, 200 gig, 400, 800, and more coming up, right? Uh, with Ethernet and InfiniBand. So to feed that, uh, to feed the GPUs with that massive amount of data. Uh, to do that, actually, we created an environment that is based only on NVMEs. So we, we and that's a key design consideration. We, we threw away all of the current uh, know-hows on how to design a parallel distributed environment, and we just re-architected everything. Uh, we were out here for 10 years, right? So it took us some time. Yeah. Uh, we, we're actually already in some massive projects already. So it took us some time and it's been validated in the field. And uh, by completely re-architecting everything for NVMEs, uh, we started with TLCs. Now we're able to also use QLCs, right? For the large capacities environments. Um, that's a complete transformation in how these GPUs can now 
efficiently uh, get, get the data. As a result, we're seeing GPU utilization go from 30%, 35% to 85, 90% and more of it. And, and the customer value is their job just gets faster and honestly, in the same amount of time, they can do much more. And yeah, I'll stop here. <laughs> I, I wanted to drill a little into that transition from TLC to QLC because every time there is a, a higher density uh, solid state storage comes out, NAND storage, we get this suggestion that it's going to be less reliable, we're not going to be able to get the transactional rates through it, it's just going to be only good for cheap and deep, and yet the reality we're seeing is, is it's definitely deep storage, but it's but behind an NVMe channel, that read performance is still spectacular. And mm -hmm. it's, what I see is that's driving that, again, higher density, lower power utilization. The whole density of things in data center is, is getting larger along with it. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. By the way, there's always the thoughts of maybe there's a new type of media, and that media is is a one-trick pony. I can only use it to back up uh, data, maybe to do fast restores, don't utilize it too much. I think there's some truth in that. It, it's not a one-trick pony as much as uh, people are trying to use new media in the ways that they did before, and, and you need to accommodate for that. So if you're just trying to blast a small amount of NVMEs, TL, even TLCs, right, or QLCs with uh, massive write IOPS, in the current traditional way storage environments work, that will create a problem. The way we solved it is by distributing our workloads in an even fashion across hundreds or thousands of these QLCs, TLCs and QLCs. So now when we're getting a workload, everything is parallelized in terms of metadata, and then everything is again parallelized in terms of data. So if we're looking at a, you know, small scale projects, 100 terabytes, it doesn't make sense to go to, to something um, that is um, a small amount of NVMEs. But if we're looking at the newer projects, and, and these are the interesting projects, uh, hundreds of petabytes, hundreds of terabytes, hundreds of petabytes, going to the exabytes already, if you put that massive amounts of QLCs out there, and then we use our code to just parallelize across them, and then we, we don't uh, hotspot any of them. So we guarantee actually utilizing all of them in an equal fashion. So then you're actually, by, by doing this new way of working with them, you actually are able to get massive performance out of them because you are parallelizing reads and writes and small IOPS across all of them. And you make sure that their wear and tear level is, is equal and controlled. Let, let's deconstruct this a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah. So we're talking about TLC versus QLC, so the underlying NAND. Then there's the form factor in the interface. And it's, it, it's, it's interesting and exciting to talk about the frontiers of AI and, NVMe and what that looks like. But let's take a, take a little step back in history, at least leading edge history, to the here and now. We still have SAS and SATA interface devices. We still have these things called RAID controllers sometimes in that environment. Hardware RAID controllers, nonetheless. You know, and uh, and so, so can you kind of walk us through so that you know, the audience has a big picture understanding of the transitions we're going through there? Mm -hmm. Because in the not too distant past and present, we have SAS, SATA, interfaced, call them SSDs, yeah. certain form factor, yeah. hot swappable, fantastic. They've got certain characteristics associated with them. You might have a hardware RAID controller in front of those to deliver caching or... or we, we do not, people no, do. No, you do not, people do, <laughs> yeah. exactly. This is my point, this is my point. So, so I'm, I'm saying, okay, I'm saying, Shimon, my units of scale are these servers with SSDs in them, SATA, SAS devices. And I'm gonna deploy 100 of these. Uh, Weka, what are you going to do for me? What are you, what are you, what are you going to tell me? What, will we, what would you counsel me in, in that regard? So, so first of all, um, the way we look at it, when you're utilizing some form of specific hardware component, mm -hmm. uh, you, you're tied in. Okay. You're tied in in a way that uh, either to that RAID con controller, to a vendor, uh, or, and honestly, you're tied in to, to, to your locality. You cannot go to other environments, a cloud or your own private clouds that do not have this. So it really limits you. Right? And, and more than that, if you're looking at the value, in the past, these so hardware components were uh, essential to accelerate your workload. I had to have a, a smart RAID controller, so then I can RAID across all multiple uh, devices, and I would offload it from the CPU to that RAID controller. What, what we're seeing now is that there already are methods of doing it in, in a very efficient way, in software, in code. You just need to work harder. Despite, like despite the fact that that's chewing up some 
cycles from other processors that are not on board a dedicated piece of hardware. Exactly. If you want to scale up and down, a RAID controller is fantastic. If you want to scale out, then suddenly a RAID controller is problematic. I'll also say one of our other analyses is it introduces another layer that you don't control. So if now I'm writing iOS to a system and it goes into servers and these servers have RAID controllers, and these RAID controllers are essentially a middleman between my, my IOs to, to my flash devices, I, I didn't write these great controllers. I didn't write the logic. I don't know what's going on in them. So suddenly when something happened, there's a new, another layer that I need to tackle. If you look at, for example, what we're doing, where everything is in code, the, from the moment where the data leaves the compute client or is actually going to the worker client on the compute client, up to the, the moment that it's spread out, shared, distributed on, on all of the NVMEs, we control all of the, all of the IO path and all of the decisions. So it really allows us to to even by not utilizing a hardware component that we don't control, it allows us to actually take the, the smarter and more efficient decision. I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's say that I have uh, 100, 100 servers, to your example, and um, I don't have these RAID controllers. We're able to look at all of the NVMEs and down to the queue depth per NVME and take smart decisions where maybe, maybe I have pre-prepared stripes, and now I see that some of the NVMEs are maybe a millisecond slower than others, Maybe I'll take a decision to not work right now with them. Maybe I'll take two or three milliseconds to, to, to let their queue depth decrease. While I work on the other NVMEs, I wouldn't be able to do that if now I have a, another hardware abstraction layer that I don't control. Plus, if I want now to, to take the same code, a Weka code, for example, and run it on cloud environments and run it on other private cloud environments, no, nobody guarantees that these hardware components and, and we talk about RAID, but there's also NVRAMs, NVDIMs, right. storage class memory, all of these hardware components are actually, to us, they're a shortcut that people had to take in the past or chose to take in the past uh, that is not necessary anymore. So Alistair, if, you don't, if you'll indulge me, I want to just follow up a little, little bit on this. So let's take that 100 node example. Yeah. Um, and I, I refer to them as units of scale for lack of a better term. Is it appropriate to think of those units of scale as potentially having uh, GPU, parenthesis S, GPUs in them, mm -hmm. processing power, along with storage devices. That's yes, good. yes or no? Yes. Yes, you would. Yes. Okay, so. Talk about it more. Okay, so, because this is what I want to know if, if I'm a practitioner. Yeah. I have my 100 units of scale. Yeah. Um, I wake up in the morning having wonderful dreams of GPUs. Yeah. I don't necessarily dream of storage devices. It's a reality. It's a reality, right? It is. I don't like that, but it's the truth. So people, people are thinking of those GPUs, and one thing they want to know for sure is, if one of my discrete storage devices goes down, does Weka take that unit of scale, that node offline, that expensive GPU that's doing all that work, does it go down when a single device goes down? How do you, how do you manage that? Yeah, so, before you answer, yeah. I've just got to point yeah. out that, that you've got one minute. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, 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 well, we'll go longer. We'll I'll, go longer. We'll say something. Yeah. So traditionally, storage has been <laughs> traditionally shared storage has been deployed as, a, as an appliance that is external to the environment, right? I have my compute, and then I have my storage. So, so in that example, people will not utilize a shared storage environment on the GPU servers. We're able to Sorry. converge the storage and the compute concurrently on the same servers in a safe fashion, and now we're able to distribute and create a shared and data and protected uh, environment. If if some of these uh, NVMEs, for example, will fail, we'll just fail them. The compute will still work. Even if all of the NVMEs on our computer- Just the devices, not the whole node, not yeah, the whole we, we, okay. we, we will do it in a safe fashion that okay. we will only control the storage layer. Okay. Usually what, what realistically happens is that the compute fails, and then it fails the storage part, okay. and then we'll also rebuild around that. Okay, makes sense. So it's a distributed spare kind of situation across the entire It's cluster. a no footprint it's storage. It's a converged storage with the GPU. You're getting the performance and, and capabilities of a high performance shared environment uh, without adding another box. Now I want to go along as well because I'm really interested in the impl implications of the data locality towards those GPUs that are processing. No data locality. Uh, Okay. Ooh, that's, that's is that okay? Is that okay? Yeah. Because of it's more than okay. When you okay. think about data locality, data locality is a compromise. Data locality was created when you had small network pipes, okay, right? and you had uh, you had to optimize to to hard drives. And again, we're going back to why hard drives made okay. sense in the past doesn't make sense anymore. 
uh, now when you look at, net, at network pipes that are faster than, than the memory speed and the, C, the CPU and the CPUs themselves, now we're able to say we're spreading everything across the entire uh, distributed environment in a way that working with a WEC amount point is faster than working with your local NVMEs. Okay. So you're, 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 saying, you're saying assume fast enough networking. <laughs> I assume at least 100 gig networking. Fair enough, fair enough. I think design for is the important thing. Design for? Yeah, design for, thank you. And, and to <laughs> avoid getting onto the three hour long podcast that Dave would like. Oh, don't um, avoid it. Shimon, clearly we haven't been able to go nearly deep enough, wide enough, or, or high enough in this topic. Where's a great place for, for the viewers here at 6.5 uh, on the road to find more about Weka? Just Google Weka, Weka Pod. We have the new Weka Pod uh, appliance that we announced, right, uh, for SuperPod uh, certification. Weka, NVIDIA, SuperPod. Um, we, we're out there on prem, on cloud. Everywhere to be consumed. Everywhere to be consumed, yeah. And uh, I w honestly, that's where I would look for Weka. Well, thank you, Shimon. Fantastic. David from Weka. Um, and thank you for joining us. Uh, Thanks to David Nicholson for joining me, Alistair Cook, here on 6.5 Media on the Road. There's plenty of great content from this Solidime series, so stay tuned to, to us wherever you're consuming.